Good evening. How y'all doing? Pai nosso que estás nos céus, santificado seja o seu nome, que a sua vontade seja feita na terra como estás feita nos céus. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. This prayer is for sure the most famous prayer in history. It's interesting, my, my daughter brought home a homework assignment from her Spanish class this week to memorize the Padre Nuestro in Spanish. Um, and it is powerful. Luke chapter 11, verse 1. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished praying, his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So there they were, watching him pray by himself. Wanting to learn to pray like that to have that kind of relationship with God, that kind of intimacy. And now in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 13, here's the prayer in its form that we're most familiar with. This, then, is how you should pray. The answer to that question teaches how to pray. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So tonight, we're going to be taking on the Lord's Prayer. And just to be super clear, um, we're not going get, to get through it, right? Uh, we'll, we'll spend at least three weeks here, maybe, maybe more. We'll see how this goes. But there's a lot packed into this prayer. In fact, tonight, we'll, we'll, we won't get out of the first verse. Um, Jesus begins that prayer. This is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Now, we are so familiar with that prayer. Most of us could probably recite that prayer. We're certainly familiar with that phrase, our Father in heaven. In fact, that's the way a lot of us begin our prayers. And that's good. Um, it's just that familiarity, I think, just to recognize that familiarity uh, can conceal, I think, the revolutionary nature, the upending nature of that beginning to a prayer, which for a Jewish man would have been um, unheard of at best, scandalous at worst, our Father who art in heaven. Calling God your Father in prayer wasn't normal. Sure, it's a metaphor used in the Old Testament, but you addressing Him as Father, unheard of. J.I. Packer wrote about it. He said, You sum up the whole of New Testament teaching in a single phrase if you speak of it as a revelation of the fatherhood of the Holy Creator. In the same way, you sum up the whole of New Testament religion if you describe it as the knowledge of God as one's holy father. If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers, and his whole outlook in life, it means he does not understand Christianity very well at all. don't know if you agree with that or not. It's a strong statement. But certainly, that idea that we have of God as our Father, that Jesus presented to us, is a central idea in the Christian faith. Paul, in Galatians 3.26, says, For you are all children of God, through faith in Christ Jesus. We are God's children. We are more than his creation. Um, we are his precious sons and daughters. Let's talk tonight briefly as we introduce this prayer about four um, reality-shaping, let's call those reality-shaping concepts from just that first 
phrase of prayer. The first one I would say is this. When I pray, I'm coming before my Father who is close, who is very close. And that was a new concept to the Jewish people. The disciples noticed that it was new and fresh and appealing. They saw that in the prayer life of Jesus, this intimacy, this familiarity that he had with the Lord that they had never seen in the lives of other rabbis, of other teachers, of other people of faith. And we know that a major part of that, the relationship Jesus had with God, uh, the major part of that was that he was, in fact, the only begotten of God. Okay. John three sixteen. So, yes, there absolutely can't overstate there was a fundamentally different relationship that Jesus had with the Father than anyone else had had before. Uh, they had existed forever in really an indescribable state of union and the disciples wanted to get a tutorial from Jesus because they noticed this difference they all also I think it's it's fair to say they also noticed the power with which he lived the power with with which he exercised um, demons and healed sicknesses um, through his authority and his relationship with God and so when he taught his disciples how to pray he taught them to pray to their Father in heaven. And that notion was revolutionary. It, it was new to the Jewish people. Now, they would have been familiar with addressing God in prayer as Elohim, very formal, yet sort of generic name for God. There were other pagan cultures around there that would have called God Elohim or used that word as well. Um, they would have addressed their God as Elohim. They would have they would have been very comfortable addressing God as their Adonai, as their Lord or Master. Uh, and they had the special name of God, which they did not use. Um, they kept it special and sacred. That name Yahweh, which was the very personal um, covenant name that God revealed, of course, first to Moses. Um, but it was a name so sacred they didn't speak it out loud. So they, they knew kind of these names, including that very intimate name, but here's Jesus when asked, teach us to pray, beginning the, essentially the model prayer, here it is, with our Father in heaven. And so Jesus needed to reveal this new dimension that they saw was a dimension he experienced in his relationship with God. But Jesus wanted to swing the doors open of this new dimension to his followers as well. So that they could experience God in that way. So it's a revolution in how human beings approached God. And in that context, it makes a lot of sense out of like that verse in Hebrews about how we approach the throne of grace with confidence. Um, when you know God as Father, it, it changes things. Not as overlord, not as slave driver, not merely as creator or almighty, but as father, it changes things. And Jesus certainly could have taught us to pray our creator who art in heaven, would have been fine, would have been true, uh, as God is our creator. But Jesus said the secret to connecting with God starts with recognizing his fatherhood in your life. And so as a precious child of God, I come knowing that God is close. That God is close. It's, it's not a spiritual long-distance phone call. And our teenagers wouldn't even know what a long-distance phone call is probably. But we don't need to shout our prayers. Some of the pagan cultures did that. We don't need to, while, while our words matter and hallowed be thy name, we want to maintain this atmosphere of holy recognition of who God is and all of that, um, but we don't have to say words in exactly the right order, exactly the right words, so that we somehow unlock that 
combination vault to heaven and have access to God. That's not how it works. That may be how you need to petition the Supreme Court if you're ever, ever advocating there. Make sure you say all the right words, all the if it please the courts. This, Jesus says, he's your father. He's your father. He's close. So it begins our father, not just some father or a father. Um, now, I don't think it necessarily, as revolutionary as that was, I don't think it would have surprised his disciples too much if Jesus had, say, had prayed, My father, which art in heaven, um, he's the only begotten son. Uh, not us, though. I mean, our identity is, that's the amazing thing. Our identity becomes clear in the very beginnings. They would have been surprised by the fact that he includes us by saying, Our father. Our father. And so he's not a long-distance Lord. He's not a distant deity. He is the God of the universe. But he is also so close. He's my father. Acts chapter 7 at 17, verse 27. This is a sermon by Paul um, on Mars Hill in Athens. Acts chapter 7, verse 27 from the message. So it, it'll sound a little different perhaps than what you're familiar with. As Paul is preaching, he says this, He, God, he doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. God the Father. Not playing hard to get. Not hiding from you. Near. And by the way, Paul is preaching this to a, a pagan audience on a hill covered in idols. God is close, guys. God is close. And as a father, he's close, but he is also caring. So here's where we have, I think this is fairly self-explanatory, but it's nice to kind of draw kind of some lines, recognize some things. Not all of us have a close relationship with our father. Not all of us enjoyed a, a being reared by a father who was caring. Or maybe was caring sometimes and seemed very cold other times or even cruel other times. I mean, those are some of the experiences that I have no doubt some of, the, some of us here at Preston Crest have ex experienced in our own relationships with our biological fathers or a stepfather or a foster father. So I think it's good to acknowledge, acknowledge God is not just a father. He's a good father. Okay, Remember what Jesus said? You human dads, you know that if your son asks for a fish, you're not going to hand him a snake. Well, you, I mean, this is my rough translation. Jesus said, you guys really aren't all that great as fathers. God is. God is caring. Uh, he is a good father. And that imagery even is captured to some extent in the Old Testament, although they didn't necessarily call God father. Um, that imagery is used um, so the psalmist, I think, captures that in Psalm 103, verses 12 to 14. Beautiful, beautiful lyrics to a song here. <clears throat> he has removed our sins as far from us as the east is from the west. That's good, isn't it? The Lord is like a father. So this is a simile in the psalm. The Lord is like a father to his children, tender and compassionate to those who fear him. For he knows how weak we are. He remembers that we are only dust. Now normally, at least I'll confess this, I think it's probably true for most of us, normally we don't want people to see our weaknesses we don't want those to be exposed, so we spend a lot of time on our resumes. We spend a lot of time, if you're looking for a job, getting just the right references. We spend a lot of time, continuing that metaphor, uh, dressing right and do, minding your P's and Q's or in a job interview, on a first date, you name it. We want to impress. Part of that, I think, uh, hardwired into us is a desire to cover up or conceal the weaknesses that all of us have. They're not all the same weaknesses, but we all have weaknesses. Um, and a lot of people work very hard, spend a lot of energy hiding weakness, concealing weakness uh, in a world 
that considers independence, that considers uh, strength, that considers being in charge, and, and those kinds of things as being very valuable and important. Um, but I would ask you this rhetorical question. I think we know the answer. Does a small child care about concealing his or her weaknesses? Three, four-year-old kid concealing their weaknesses from their parents. Is their natural tendency when they fall down and scrape up their leg and it hurts like crazy, is their natural tendency stiff upper lip, no, I'm perfectly fine? No, that's not. (laughs) Certainly not. Um, generally, the little ones are very open, aren't they, with expressing that their tummy hurts, with expressing that late at night they had a bad dream, or there's a monster in the closet, and running into mom and dad's room and hopping in bed with them, because they know they're safe there. Normally, a small child is very okay with being held when they're not feeling well. And so our our heavenly Father, your heavenly Father, I love that phrase. (laughs) He knows our weaknesses. He knows, he knows that we're just dust. He knows what's up. We're not going to hide any of that from him. We're not going to pad our resume or, or manage to fool him with our impressive words or how we handle ourselves. Uh, He knows our weaknesses, so we're not hiding those from him. There's freedom in that. There's great freedom in that. Knowing that he looks at you and he remembers who you are. That your days are numbered. And that you have your weaknesses. So he's rescued us from sin, which is good news. The psalmist says he is also just like a father, a good father, Just like a good father with a child, tender and compassionate. Number three, our Father who art in heaven. Number three, when I pray, I'm coming before my Father who is constant. I'm not always that constant. I have good days and I have bad days. Um... I think I'm generally a, a pretty good dad. But I've had my moments, which I certainly want, wouldn't want to have replayed for y'all tonight on the screens. Not maybe being the best dad. Or being a little inconsistent, a little patchy with the way I father my kids. But Jesus reminds us he's our father in heaven. <laughs> he's our father in heaven. In heaven, there are no tornado sirens. There are no stock market crashes or corrections, right? It's a nice way of saying, uh uh-oh. In heaven, there are no emergency rooms where the car crash victims go. In heaven, there is constant perfection. No disasters in heaven. And he can identify with us. You may be thinking, well, that sounds distant to me. Thought he was close. Surely he can't understand us. Of course he can understand us because he also put on flesh and became one of us in that great mystery of the Trinity. In Christ, he became one of us. In Christ, he suffered through all the inconsistencies and the ups and downs and the rejection, and applause, all of that, of being a human being. He lived in this world that is anything but constant. But the prayer Jesus teaches here reminds us that when we bow our hearts before our Father, He's in heaven. He's in heaven where everything is okay. Malachi 3, verse 6, God proclaims, I am the Lord, and I do not change. You can know that when you approach the throne of God, you are approaching God who is reliable, 
who is consistent, who doesn't have bad days, all right? Number four, and this will be our last one before we close out our time together. Number four, when I pray, I'm coming before my Father who is capable. It's a good thing to acknowledge, I think, as we come into this prayer. He is capable. I certainly unburden myself with some friends and colleagues and others who have some capabilities, but not in the sense that God is capable. So he's not just our Father in heaven, meaning he's not shaken, he's not toppled over by the storms that we face. There's also this reality, since he is in heaven, of meaning he has access to resources we can't even imagine. All the resources, literally, in the universe, at his disposal. And while he's close to us, and while he cares for us as a good father does, the fact that we're praying to our Father which art in heaven reminds us that he has unlimited resources, wisdom and wealth, resources of power and grace to help us in our hour of need. Our Father in heaven, I think, is the, is the perfect beginning to this prayer because it acknowledges that our God is capable. Paul wrote that beautiful letter to the Ephesians, a group that was facing all sorts of struggles, just internally as a church. Um, divisions amongst themselves because of different religious heritages that were present in that body of believers there in Ephesus. They were shaken up by probably a lot of the same things that shake us today. And so he shared with them in this prayer in Ephesians chapter 3, just a part of it that you're familiar with, verses 20 to 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to spend a few weeks here, and I think Jesus has a lot to teach us about prayer. So I'm excited about this. Let's bow our heads. I want to wrap up this time. I don't want to just talk about prayer or talk about this prayer. I want us to engage in prayer as we finish out this message time this evening. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we long to know you more deeply. We desire to feel your love more tangibly. We want to approach your throne with the innocence of a young child stumbling into mom and dad's bedroom late at night after a scary dream. We want to call out to you as children that know you're the one. You're the one who we can count on. You're our Abba, our Father, our Daddy. And we also tonight express our desire to be fathered by you, to be reared by you, to be taught by you, not just comforted by you, not just the recipients of material and other gifts from you, but we want to be fathered by you, trained by you, challenged by you, inspired by you, motivated by you, applauded by you. We want to be fathered by you. We even, while we may not feel it all the time, we even in our souls want to be corrected by you as our loving Father. And so we invite you tonight to do whatever you need to do in our lives to remake us into the image of Jesus, the firstborn of all creation. We've been adopted into your family, and we want to be more and more like Jesus. 
the Son of God. This is our prayer tonight in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's be standing. Let's worship together.